Hello, welcome to another episode of Not Alone Today podcast. I am Anu. And I am Joseph. Welcome. Today's um, episode would be on pastoral ministry. Um, we have a question from Kunle that I'm going to read out. He said, I'm at a point in my life where I feel strongly that I have a call into pastoral ministry. And I've gotten confirmations from friends and some pastors about this. But... I want to know what pastoral ministry is all about because I feel unqualified. Mm. And also, I want you, that's to call out, I want you to share what what was it like starting um, the ministry and what things did Kola have to do? Mm. How did they prepare and how has it continued preparing? How did you prepare and continue to stay prepared? Good. So... (laughs) Yeah. Then he said, does, does being in pastoral ministry mean you wouldn't have to do anything else? Like, say, have another job on the side. And that what challenges come with pioneering a ministry? Mm. So I hand over to our pastor to tell us, give us, give us advice on this area. Who is your pastor? You. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, um, interesting question from Kunle, and I've actually had a conversation with Kunle after this question to get a bit more, to know where he's coming from, mm-hmm. basically, um, so that um, we could speak into the question um, with, at least with some more context. Mm-hmm. Um, Kunle is a, is a university graduate, uh, uh, so he's, but he's yet to start doing anything in terms of like secular job or whatever. Okay. Um, so he's at that, that stage of life in a sense. You can sense from the question that he's genuinely concerned. Mm-hmm. One is is persuaded on the one hand that mm-hmm. this is what God wants me to do. He's convinced. He's gotten lots of confirmations in that regard. But again, he's burdened mm-hmm. about his sense of qualification for it, his sense of worthiness, as mm. it were. Oh, um, and then about how, how, how can he be effective in this? And one of the things he disclosed to me um, in confidence is also the fact that if felt like it's not just God calling him into pastoral, pastoral ministry in the sense of um, joining a church to that is already like a, an established church to pastor therein, mm. but something like pioneering um, something, yeah. that's the vibe mm-hmm. he's getting, if I could use that word, vibe. vibe. Oh, <laughs> sounds <all> that's, pastoral. <laughs> that's, that's what he's sensing in his spirit, to mm. sound more spiritual. <laughs> um, so yeah, but... <sighs> I mean, this is a sensitive question, absolutely. And I can't begin to share just based on my experience as though my experience is the valid authority in Mm. this regard. People's experiences are myriad. They are different. They are Mm. unique to them in that sense. But I still believe that on a generic level, the first thing that I would say to Kunle to be clear about, thank God for his persuasion, thank God for the confirmations. But I want to start with the the big questions of any project or mission in life, the why, mm-hmm. the what, the where, the when, and the how. Mm. Um, and of course, these are not questions that you will get answers to on the spur of the moment. I sure. mean, they are not the kind of questions that you just have a dream and or have a vision and all of them are just stabled out. You know why God is calling you into pastoral ministry. You know what he's calling you to do. You know how he wants you to do it. You know when he wants you to do do it Mm. and you know where he wants you to do it Mm. in my own experience and in the experience of very many much more senior pastors that have either interacted with one-on-one or or learned about their stories this kind of answers come by progressive revelation Mm. and this is not even just only about pastoral ministry i think generally in life if you're asking all those big questions about what on earth am i here for to use the the title of requirements classic Mm. The answers to those kind of questions, as much as there is a biblical framework Mm. within the biblical framework, these specific answers to those questions will come by progressive revelation. Mm. And oftentimes they are tied to the journey you are already on. They are tied to where God is already bringing you from and where he's taking you to. Mm. Uh, But it's very important to know why 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 and what of course the why oftentimes determines the what why is god calling you into pastoral ministry Mm. why now in Mm. that sense how does he want you to go about it what's the next step he wants you to take what's the timeline basically Mm. that is associated to this calling 
And lastly, where? Is there a specific geographical location? Is there a specific people group that it wants you to reach out to? Mm. And things like that. So all of those kind of things are the kind of questions or the big questions I would say Kunle should begin to wait on God upon um, and start getting answers to them. So that's that's where I would start from. Uh, but we can then begin to take those questions one by one and feel free to chip in uh, your thoughts as well on, on these questions one by one. So let's start with the first one. Okay. So what is pastoral ministry all about? <laughs> so just keep it simple. The word pastor, uh, the few times it occurs in the New Testament, is tied f- to the root word uh, that we get the word shepherd from. Um, and a shepherd basically looks after sheep. Uh, in fact, in my in my mother tongue, in my local language, the, the Yoruba translation of a pastor is Olushua Gutan, one who keeps the sheep. And that's that's what pastoral ministry is all about. Um, of course, we can then begin to unpack what that would look mm-hmm. like. There, what kind of sheep are we talking about? What species of sheep <laughs> <laughs> are we talking about? What's unique about um, those kind of sheep and all of those many other questions that we can begin to look at? Um, and in that regards, I won't forget that one. Of the very first lesson I learned in Bible school, and we'll talk more about Bible school shortly, is 10 groups of people you cannot help. Hmm. because the thing about shepherds is to think yeah once you know this is the people god is calling me to yeah i just want to be a pastor to them i've been called into pastoral ministry i must be a people helper Hmm. i must do this i must do that um but just knowing that (laughs) you can't help everybody Hmm. um there are just some kind of group of people that you cannot help um and that's that's a loaded um, lesson that stayed with me. That was the very first thing I learned in Bible school and it still continues to ring through in my mind. So yeah, that's what pastoral ministry is about. Taking care of God's people by the grace that God himself supplies. Thank you. That's very clear. So when you were starting your pastoral ministry, mm. what was it like? What was it like? <laughs> Interesting question. On the one hand, I'm tempted to think of 2012 as the time that I started pastoral ministry. Mm -hmm. And that would be right in the sense of, yeah, that was when the reality fully dawned on me that, okay, this is what I believe God wants me to spend the rest of my life doing. But that's when you knew you were, 2012 was when you knew, when you heard God calling you. Did you hear him? Did you, (laughs) was it a dream? Was it an angel tapping you (laughs) to say, my son, I'd like you to go into ministry. Is that how angels sound? How many angels have you encountered? And how did they sound? Um, but that's a beautiful question. Because, uh, again, many times when we talk about God called me, God called me, it can sound so vague and mm-hmm. so meaningless or so just supposed to sound spiritual without it really, yeah. But in my own case, um, so 2010, I finished uni, my first degree in uni. I'm sorry, how old were you then? I just want to see the In age. 2012 or 2010? 2010, I was 21. Okay. I actually finished 2009, but got my certificate 2010. So, yeah. Okay. Um, February 2010 was when I finished uni, uh, first degree. And then I, I had like a gap year of just doing all sorts of stuff before going to, to observe what we call NYC in Nigeria, where you just serve the government. And that's like the, the one year that you you used to begin to think about the future, Mm. about the rest of your life, basically. It's the one year when people my age at the time are thinking about applications to different jobs. Uh, It's the time when some are thinking, okay, now is the time to apply to universities abroad to go and do my master's and things like that. But while all of that was going on around me, for whatever reason, I had a burden to devote that one year on the one hand to serve God, but on the other hand to begin to ask with some curious intentionality what will you have me do for the rest of my life Mm. i just don't want to follow the rhythm the traditional um get a job in a bank yeah just finish nyc and get a job and come and give a testimony about it and just continue living your life like that Mm. i felt like there was something pivotal at that point Mm. uh, for me to choose right and be sure that whatever it is that i'm choosing to go into going forward would be the path that God wants me to take that will lead me into the rest of my life and into the fulfillment of God's destiny for me. So that was very, 
um, pertinent on my heart. It was in all of my prayers at every opportunity. Mm. And then at the end of that program in 2012, February, um, which was also the month when my beautiful wife, then my fiancé, became, officially became my fiancé. Um, so you were young? Yeah, 20, 22. So you were 22, 22 at the time 22, when yeah. you got the calling. Mm-hmm. So apart from having gotten the calling also, you were led to the person you want to marry. Mm, yeah. So what, what did I feel like having to make those two huge decisions, so to say? It's looking back in retrospect, we can begin to link them together. It didn't link together like that in my mind. Okay. When I was going for that NYSE, yeah, like I said, getting into a relationship was the last thing on my mind, like seriously. Um, I just wanted to serve God and get answers to those big questions on mm. my heart. And then God brought this dainty damsel into my life who came to tell me I am ready <laughs> six days to when I was supposed to be wrapping up my NYC program. Um, and that just kind of threw me into another world entirely. The world of, on the one hand, still figuring out what is it that God wants me to do for the rest of my life. Mm. And on the other hand, knowing that now I don't have to just answer that question on my own or for mm. my own sake. I have to also factor in the fact that I'm in a relationship with someone else. Mm. It turns out, of course, that the relationship itself became so pivotal to my confirmation to the fact that I feel called into pastoral ministry. And that's where I'm going with that story. So you were 23 at this time. I just wanted, I want to follow the timeline. Mm-hmm. You're 23. You yeah. had finished NYSE. Mm-hmm. The calling I didn't come yet, but you had you had a notion about where God is leading you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So now you're back at home after your NYSE. Mm-hmm. Okay. Please go on. Yeah. You said the calling I didn't come yet, and yes and no, but you get why I said yes and no. Okay. So yeah. So I was back. I I got back home. I think that February or March that year mm. um and then again i continue to pray still one wanting to know exactly what's going on i had options before i left the state where i served in the north Gombe state i had options to work which i turned down because i felt like that was not where god wants me to go um so i'm back home and just still doing life still living with my parents which is not what everybody wants to do at that time you just want to be independent um and then we had a visitor a senior pastor that had pastored um, the church where my parents attend mm. uh, came around and visited. And as he was about to leave, you know, just our pastors would do, okay, let's pray, mm. that kind of stuff. And he started praying. And as he was praying, um, he, he ministered in the prophetic and, and gave me an instruction. He said he felt like God is saying that he wants to show me some things about the kind of people that will connect me to the destiny he's taking me to, blah, 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 blah. He, he says he thinks that God, God wants me to wait on him, mm. like, more intentionally and just find answers to those things like god wants to show me some things let me see what god wants to show me Mm. and so i decided to make space for that it it was during the easter of that year april 2012 i decided to just do a personal retreat for three days oh well retreat that sounds interesting so how did that come about like what was the retreat like did you have to go like on a mountain (laughs) He said three days. What so now, made you, now I'm on the hot seat. <laughs> what made you choose three days as opposed to, I don't know, just knew that I'm praying, that's God, and God will reveal what He wants to say to you. That makes sense. Uh, sounds like why would you need to fast sometimes when we do fast, when your fasting actually doesn't necessarily change anything, it doesn't change God. What it changes is the fact that He focuses your intentional um, attentiveness to receive whatever God is doing. That's exactly what I think a retreat is. An opportunity for you to just block out all the distractions and and maintain a posture where you are intentionally ready to receive what God wants to say to you. And what did that look like in 2012 April for me? It looked like just moving on to the second flat of my parents. I was living with my parents. We they were they had a two flats. The second flat was empty. I withdrew myself into that. Of course, I told them, of course, that I'm going to be disappearing <laughs> for, for the next three days. Um, I'll be in the second flat. I just want to pray and, and wait on God and, and, yeah, get answers. That's that's interesting because when you said retreat, I was thinking of, oh, traveling to Kidderminster to, to book a hotel. <laughs> There's no Kidderminster in Ife. It will be a, a, an Ife Kidderminster. <laughs> Kidderminster is a town in West... Um, West Midlands in the West UK. Midlands, yeah. So, so 
a retreat could actually be done in your house. It's just Absolutely. that being separate yeah. and being intentional, I see. Like, it actually, it's good for me. Shutting to, out the distractions. I think that's the key. Shutting out the distractions. Whatever say. that would look like. So if you go to a hotel and you believe being in an hotel will shut out the distraction shut and you won't out. be distracted with the television and free stuff subscription to watch premier league and I, whatever <laughs> anyway so i found myself <laughs> um, in this second flat um just with my with my laptop and 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 a notepad and uh yeah there was no internet or anything so so what what did you do at the retreats what did i do i prayed and listened to messages and, and wrote down whatever I think God was saying at you every point in time. You wrote things down. Yeah. Ah, that's that was important. the huge chunk of it, writing things down, then praying. Not even just only for myself. Mm. I, I went with a list of people that I wanted to pray for. Okay. As much as I knew I was going to wait on God for that, I'm also like, it's not like I'm just going to stand waiting for 24 hours in three places just <laughs> just thinking through things so um i was writing things down whatever mm. i was listening to messages and those messages were speaking to me as a matter of fact the mm. second day when i felt this the strong um call it was because i've just finished listening to a message um, i can't remember who preached the message the man of god ended that message by making an altar call mm. and then he was in the spirit and saying uh, and then he said something like there's someone in this audience that god is calling you into pastoral ministry Whoa. and he wants to call the person out to pray for the person to the best of my knowledge in that particular message nobody came out mm. and i felt like god was saying nobody came out because the man of god was speaking at that time for a message that i was going to listen to i don't know mm. how many years later to be the one to respond that was actually how all of this started and then it started laying scriptures on my heart which i've never thought about opening them up and saying things about i'm sending you around the world with the message of my saving grace and da 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 da, da. i mean all sorts of things mm. just started pouring at that point in time i was wow. in tears i was just praying and just confused but at the same time mm. blissfully enjoying god's presence to know that yeah you've got me i, I don't know how this is going to play out um but the huge confirmation then came in because one of the things that I struggled with was then to say, God, you know, I've just gotten into a relationship. How is this going to play out? This is a lady that asked me specific questions before she said yes to my proposal. And part of those questions were, what, what's your plan for the future? And I didn't say anything about being a pastor. And so I was thinking in my mind, she said yes to me on the agreement that there was nothing like that in the mm. mix. Now that this is coming into the mix, what would happen? And God said, he simply said, send her a message and ask her what she thinks about it. And I sent you a message. And what did she say? What did you say? <laughs> <laughs> what did she you say? <laughs> what did you say? Can you remember? I think I said I have it written down in case you, you say it. Wrong. <laughs> okay, I'll just... let's see. I'll paraphrase. I said something like, I already knew that God... God had told me mm. what... Uh, God had told me you'd be a pastor. I was just waiting for you to confirm it. And that when you said you were going to be, um, when you talked about your public health things, mm. I was just thinking, like I went back to God to say, are you sure it was to be a pastor? And he said I should wait, it will come to. Mm, 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 what did mm, I, what mm. did I write there? I'm surprised, I'm surprised you still remember that phrase of you will come to. Okay, so when I asked you um, the, the question, you said, when you told me about your purpose, this is you speaking back to me in a text mm. message, actually. Mm. When you told me about your purpose, I kept listening for a long-term pastoral work, but you didn't mention it. And so I asked God, what was all this grooming that you've been giving me about? Then God said, you will come to, in quotes, that I will come to. Mm. So I'm not surprised, you said in the message. So I'm not surprised in the least, and I've always expected it. Calm down, okay? I'm on. <laughs> At times, I'll look at my image in the mirror and the Lord will tell me, you won't always look like this. Or I'll find myself looking at those deeper life women <laughs> and God will say, this is how you will be in the next few years. <laughs> so I have no fears and I trust and I trust you don't. It sounds right. And that was it. That was all I needed. That was all the confirmation that I needed to know that. Wow. So I was like, in the first instance, I then became in awe of the fact that, oh my word, I'm, 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 I mean, it just took my, my respect for God's grace upon your life to another level. And yeah, I'm not saying that because we're on the podcast. <laughs> it's just the truth. That someone would say yes to a guy that you knew was supposed to be something that he is not and he's still not looking like he's going to be it. 
<laughs> and it took a few months and you still went ahead. I mean, that's just mind blowing for me mm-hmm. and very humbling. So yeah, that was the main yeah confirmation okay that that's great thank you for that and all this happened when you were 23 i think i'm mentioning the age i'm focusing on the age just to show that there's no young age to start absolutely knowing the direction god is leading you to you didn't have to be 35 be, be, before you start being intentional having that retreat absolutely. to find out what's your purpose it doesn't have to be on pastoral ministry mm. it could be for a particular job or or role or what, just being intentional before going down the main route of committing yourself to a career to say god is this what you want me to do mm, that's brilliant thank you for that beautiful um explanation of how you arrived at your pastoral ministry thank you <laughs> and the preparation you made it, it makes sense and it's 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 i'm hoping i teaching everyone to be intentional about when they're at this phase of their lives, to make making decision about the way forward, mm. even if even if you've made a mistake and you're not sure where you are, you can still go back, isn't it? Absolutely. And and make that commitment to God to ask, what exactly do you want me to do mm. here on earth? Okay. The next question now says, how did you prepare? <clears throat> so you've 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 confirmed uh-huh. the calling, and the person you you and your fia- then fiance has confirmed uh-huh. that she's in the same boat with you. Uh-huh. So how did you prepare? What resources? What tools prepared you? And uh-huh. the second question would now be: How have you continued to stay prepared? That's. I mean, when I saw that part of Kunle's question, I was like, "Wow, nice question. How did I prepare?" And that's that's the part that takes me to the to the point where I was saying that actually maybe the calling did not come in 2012. Of course, mm. our stories had been written before the beginning began. On the one hand, mm. on the other hand is the fact that actually, if I'm being honest, mm. in retrospect, the journey of my life had prepared me. Had began the preparation for that point in 2012 and mm. thereafter. In the sense that I can look back to myself and I can see my 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 days in what we call the children's Sunday school mm. um, in the church where I grew up and how I'm always being saddled with all of this um, leadership responsibility. <laughs> um, I can look back to my my ten year old self, a primary five or year five um, pupil in a primary school. Mm. Um, in a church where all we had as a church structure was just some pillars and a roof. Mm. Um, a church that is so exposed that you won't want to invite your friends to come. But yet I'll be going to church every Sunday, walking to church with this unexplainable delight in my heart. <laughs> um, then I was beginning to play the drums mm. and I'll be going to church and, and making conversations to God like, God, all those big brothers that used to play drums in church today, let them give me at least just five minutes, maybe during when we are collecting offering and singing so that I can also play the drums <laughs> and be a blessing to you. I mean, oh. those were the kind of conversations my 10, 11 year old self was having with God on a Sunday morning. Um, and very many opportunities and privileges like that throughout my secondary school day for whatever reason i was being called pastor mm. as a nickname that stuck and i didn't know why that happened i mean <laughs> i can remember my 11 year old self standing before my class teaching from john chapter 8 the story of the woman that was caught um in the very act of adultery because somebody in class stole and i was the class rep and so i i leveraged on my position as the class rep to stand before them in front of the class and, and preach to them like even when someone was caught in the very act of adultery jesus was merciful so if you are the one that stole it come out and, and, and talk to me about it. that was that was the kind of wow. um, that was the kind of upbringing that i had and this is not to say i'm the perfect person i had my secret struggles and secret sins and all of that mm. but in spite of that the calling had been there all along mm. um my university became the, my first degree days became like an a beautiful opportunity to develop many of these things with mm. lots of re- leadership responsibilities from my first year to my final year mm. in different capacities leading pastoring few people in a particular hostel to mm pastoring the whole fellowship in my final year as the president and all of those kind of responsibilities prepared me for what happened in 2012 in a sense so you had already started preparing without knowing you were preparing exactly and i think that's very much like god when david was being called to come and face goliath Mm. it was not at that moment that he started preparing to, to kill a giant it's he had done that with the lion he had done that with the bear Mm. when he was going to stand before goliath it became a walkover i think that was what it felt like for me 
Um, so it wasn't too unthinkable, mm. if I'm being honest, to look back and say, yeah, I think I've actually had some Inclin. some, <laughs> some incline, inclination or, or leanings mm. towards this kind of a life. Uh, so it wasn't too difficult a pill to swallow, yeah. Great, thank you. So starting from 2012, yeah. when you were sure and yeah. you prayed about the people you're supposed to meet. Yeah. So can you tell us what, how God led you to those three people? Mm. that the man said you would meet and that's where your journey would start so so you're telling us about the three people mm. and also you um you're linking that to the actual pastoral ministry mm. in a sense again like i said from day one i knew that the shift the focus shifted from wanting to know who those people are mm-hmm. to wanting to know what the destiny and the assignment is okay and on discovering that the first thing that i knew god um, laid on my heart and bless my parents. God bless them. Um, when I told them this after the three days, I mean, I can remember how they would come to the window of the room where I was doing the retreat every <laughs> night. They won't enter there. They just look around the window and greet me. I hope everything is okay. I hope you are still alive. Oh, <laughs> um, and then eventually on the third day when I was done and came back, came out of the of the of the second flat to meet them and told them, okay, this is what I believe God is saying to me. Mm. Initially, they 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 had their huge reservations. Um, for someone that is just coming fresh from uni and then the next thing you're thinking is to be a pastor and I, I didn't just want to be a pastor I felt like I was sure of where God wanted me to do that there was this mm-hmm. ex- ecstasy and excitement and urgency to do it in, in the church where they've they've been members and leaders um, for a long while so you know your at, 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 after that retreat mm-hmm. you knew your why mm-hmm. <laughs> you knew your what Mm. I'm not sure I'm saying it in the right order. Yeah. You knew the why. Mm-hmm. You knew the where. Yeah. So you were now beginning to know the how. Exactly. And that's where this is leading us to. All of those things, I knew them in parts. I knew the why, like I said, part of the things that came up, that God laid on my heart immediately after all of this was a particular Bible verse that seemed to capture the message that I believe. On the one hand, it has been the message he has been laying on my heart and, and using me to teach people. But on the other hand, that became more pronounced at that point in time. Mm. Um, on the, then secondly, I knew the words in a sense, mm. pastoral ministry. Um, the way it came to me then was like full-time pastoral ministry. That's mm. a language I won't necessarily use now. Uh, but it looked like this is the only thing you're going to do for the rest of your life. Mm. And it, it's, it's been the core thing indeed. Mm. Um, but besides that, I also knew the way in the sense of, yeah, it's going to be in the church that I could call my parents' church, the church that I, I didn't used to feel like calling my church. <laughs> but then it's going to become my church. I've always known it as my parents' church. Um, very traditional, very conservative. Um, Pentecostal church in Nigeria, classical Pentecostal church. Um, so yeah, I knew the where, and I felt like I knew the when. I like, what are we waiting for? Let's just get on with it. But bless my parents, like I said, after all of this, the first thing they did was to say, let's let's just go to God in prayers and and get more clarity about this. Mm. And so they they had videos with myself. Their pastor friend was with us. We just prayed. And waited on God, received prophetic messages, all of these things being written down. Okay. So that gave me more clarity. Mm-hmm. And part of the instructions that came from that was to say, the same pastor that visited the other day and, and, and gave the prophetic word to start with, mm-hmm. go and visit him and tell him, you've gone through the assignments mm-hmm. and this is the result. And, and let's see what happens from there. And so I knew that that was one of the people in a sense, that God wanted me to just report to, submit myself to, and say, here I am, send me. Mm. I went to the pastor in Lagos and told him, and that was the beginning of a journey um, Mm -hmm. that had lasted from then till till now, of course, led into many other dimensions and different things along the line. Thank you very much for that. And so, oh, I like that you had a support. So not only that you had the calling, you Mm -hmm. had... You had people around you supporting you. First, your fiancé saying, confirming that. Yeah. Then your parents, mm-hmm. which is good. So would, well, what would you say to Kunle? In that regard, mm. Mm, uh, he said he's, he's persuaded. Mm-hmm. He's, he's got confirmations from his friends and from from some pastors. That's mm. beautiful. Um, again, like I said, our stories are unique. Mm. 
I don't know the kind of family Kunle is from and all of that. He might not have the privilege or luxury of of having the kind of parents that I had and the kind of sensitivity they had into this and how they undo the matter with such sensitivity. But the point is you need a support system. You mm-hmm. need a support structure. Besides my fiancé, besides my parents, there were many other friends out there. Um, my mentor, um, different other people that I just felt the sense of responsibility to let them know this is the journey that I'm about to go on. And, and every single one of them is either they are coming from, we've seen it coming, uh, we we believe this is God leading you. And there was that huge support system that was there, um, such that even when I know that I, there are so many uncertainties, I still felt so safe and secure in knowing mm. that there is this village of angels mm. that I could always lean back on. Um, as much as, of course, at the end of the day, in, in, in when it comes to calling, whatever that is, pastoral calling or otherwise, or even mm. in your secular thingy, our ultimate trust is in God. Mm. But of course, God will help man through men. Mm. He will not um, descend miraculously and help you. It will send people. And so when you could have such people to count on, I mean, it's such a beautiful gift to, to be preserved. And Thank that's you. been my story and experience. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just one more thing on that point you just raised. Yeah. So this village of angels, now that you are continuing in pastoral ministry, mm-hmm. do you still have that support? Do you still report to them? Or has it dwindled down to no, just a few? There is always a support system per time. Some of these people had stayed through from that time till now. Mm -hmm. Some, by virtue of relocations or moving on or different seasons or whatever, transfers and all sorts of things, I've had to, I'm no longer in touch with them as I used to be. Mm -hmm. Um, And that's understandable. There are relationships God will bring into your life that it's not like you just have to hang on to them for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. Some very many relationships are seasonal. And when that season passes, you move on with it into the new connections that God is going to be taking you into. Um, Presently in the UK, which I didn't foresee when this was happening in 2012. So the kind of support system that I'm building here, um, it's different in a sense than the people that were there in Nigeria, but some of those had stayed true and will probably continue to stay true. Mm. Thank you. So let's backtrack to 2012 at that retreat. So you mentioned um, that you knew about the full-time ministry mm-hmm. at the time of the retreat. Or oh, you did mention as though it was a, just a glimpse of what it would look like. It would mm-hmm. be full-time. And does, did you know at the time that full-time would mean not having any other vocation, like no other job? You'd just be a pastor. Mm. And if you knew that, how ready were you? Did it give you a chest-tightening frustration <laughs> that this is it? Okay, so, yeah, in the context of the church in which I believe that God was leading me to start this journey, Mm. uh, when they say full-time ministry, what that meant is full-time ministry, (laughs) like you're not supposed to do any other thing than just being a pastor. Mm. Um, Of course, over the years with um, coming to, to study in a Bible college in the UK, living in the UK and working in the UK and all of that, I've, I've, my understanding of that phrase has expanded. So I don't see ministry in terms of whether you're full-time or past, part-time. If you're in ministry, you're in ministry, mm-hmm. even whether you're in the secular world or, or whatnot. Um, that said, the fact remains that it was a reality in that setting that full-time ministry means you're going to be on collecting stipends for the rest of your life. They don't, I mean, pastors don't even get salaries in that church. Um, and yeah, was that a challenge for me? I didn't feel like it was. I felt like I was so persuaded of God's faithfulness. <laughs> um, even it felt like even if I'm the only one in this boat with God, I'm good for it and I'm good to go. And that's me being very sincere. Um, I can't explain it. Um, so for Conley, if that's a worry, and understandably, it, it looks like it's a worry because Conley is mentioning that... Um, Does that mean I won't have to do any other thing? Mm. Don't think about that. Mm. Think about the caller and the and the call and the call, the assignment. Mm. Think about he that has called. The Bible says, "Faithful is he who has called you." Who we also do Mm. is the caller and is the one that supplies the grace to do whatever it is that he has done. I like the person that said that um, 
when God sends you on an errand, he pays the transport fare. I think I'm a living testimony to that. Great. Thank you very much for that. So the last question for Kunle before we round it up is, what are the challenges that comes with pioneering a ministry? And pioneering a ministry means starting a new church, isn't it? Not is necessarily. Nice? I mean, that's what... I think Kunle is saying from my conversation with him, that's what he's sensing. And yeah, that's that's a form of pioneering. I mean, presently I'm, I'm on, on a program called the Pioneering School mm. um, and uh, from CMS in London. And the, the understanding of pioneering, my understanding of pioneering has gone, has been amplified basically beyond starting a church um, necessarily. I, I used to not think that I've pioneered anything until mm. I joined the school. And mm. then looking back in retrospect, thinking of things like a live mentorship group and all that, um, I saw that, yeah, I'm actually a pioneer of some sort. We are pioneers. Yes. <laughs> I like that. But that said, what are the challenges that come with that? So the only, uh, that's one ready example I can look back to to say, what was it like starting AMG? And what has the journey been like? The major thing being, not being not being able to know the full details just mm. figuring things out as you go along mm. and mm. so i think that's the it's a challenge but at the same time it can be a strength it can be a positive or a negative not knowing what to do should put you in the posture of always being willing to learn unlearn relearn adapt mm. and mm. so if you are coming with that posture of yeah I'm starting something that God is calling me to start, whether that is a church or just some form of um, parachurch ministry or whatever that could look like. I'm open to learn. I'm mm. open to unlearn. I'm open to relearn. And I'm open to adapt, to just change with the tides. Thank COVID-19 you. has taught all of us the need or the necessity for adaptability mm. in leadership. I, I think that's the main thing that I would uh, point Kunle towards, to say, don't stay rigid. Mm. Okay. In ministry, pioneering ministry for that matter, you don't want to stay rigid. You Thank want to you. be open to Thank change. Thank you very yeah. much for that. What practical tips will you give to Kunle in light of this um, conversation and your ex- what you've shared with us? Hmm. That's that's a big question. And of course, I'm, I'll try as much as possible, God helping me, to make this applicable to everybody okay. um, beyond just Kunle. Okay. The first tip, just reflecting back on my own story, experience is to start writing things down mm. i can easily go back to my red journal i call it my red journal and dig out your exact words <laughs> in that text message um in april 2012 that gave me the first boost of confirmation and confidence to say yes i'm mm. going for this why because i wrote it down mm. so that's the first tip um, the second tip is don't be so preoccupied with wanting to get all the details that you never start mm-hmm. Again, that's another common um, limitation or barrier that many people have to face, be it in ministry or any other thing, actually. Wanting to know all the details before we launch out. More so in in, in ministry, there is always that element of faith. Mm -hmm. And faith means you you don't have all the answers, you don't have all of them. But when you take a step, you see more. The path of the justice as a shining light that shines brighter and brighter. What that means is taking a step. The more steps you take, the brighter the path shines. The third tip I'm going to give Conley and everyone listening is that um, marry the person that God wants you to marry. Marry the person that God is leading you to marry. Marry a helpmate. And the interesting thing about that is, of course, God gets to be the one that chooses that for you. Um... The Bible says in the book of Proverbs, he that finds a wife finds a good thing and obtains favor from God. I can't um, overemphasize the place of who God led me to marry and how that, I mean, the, play, the role that played in my ministerial journey, I can't, I can't just underrate it. I can't underplay it um, from then till now and God willing till forever. Um, so, yeah. Kunle, don't just jump into any kind of relationship with anybody. So yeah, be, let God lead you in your marital life. You mm-hmm. can't afford to marry just anybody. You want someone that God would, that God has configured to grow with you together in this journey, to 
go with you and to groan with you. So they are praying with you, they are journeying with you, and they are also developing and growing together um, with you in that journey. That's very, very important. I mean, we've done a, a, an episode earlier on on marrying a pastor uh, in which we we talked about the fact that that's actually a peculiar thing anybody can be a wife i don't think everybody can be a pastor's wife <laughs> um so yeah marry right it's it's just very crucial and then um the the other thing i would say is to resource yourself resource yourself get all the education you can um, some people would belittle the need for seminary education or Bible college education in ministry. And yeah, there are so very many successful pastors out there who never attended a Bible college or a seminary. But I, I would say that as much as God gives you the grace and, and grants you the, the support of your spouse, get all the education you can get. Uh, find a seminary where the faculty is made up of people that are Bible lovers and mm. model pastors themselves. A place where you can learn to do ministry in a way that is very, very hands on, life on life. People that are modeling for you what you are hoping to do. Not necessarily in the full details of exactly the kind of ways and styles and roles in which they do what they do, but for you to see what it looks like to follow Christ mm. and have other people follow you as you follow Christ. Paul mm. said, follow me as I follow Christ. He could say that because the priority for him is his personal journeying and following after Christ. And mm. he knows that as long as Christ is the one he's following, he can as well beckon on any other person to say, follow me, mm. because I'm following Christ. You, you find such, such um, gems or, or learnings through mentorship and through Bible-centered um, seminaries and Bible colleges. Mm. By God's grace, I'm, I'm glad for the Bible college I attended here in the UK. Um, for that same singular reason, the structure is, apart from the fact that it's made up of, the faculty is made up of a team of people that you know that they love what they do, mm. but the structure is such that it gives room for mentoring within that setting. So you are serving in a unit and you have a particular leader that you are responsible to and who is not just interested in giving you task, 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 but they are interested in your personal growth mm. and development as all of you together are growing together in God's word or with God's word as the standard. So yeah, get that kind of education. Mm -hmm. Lastly, don't ignore the journey you've been on, Kunle. Everything that you have experienced has prepared you for this moment. You are the threshold that feels like a new beginning and indeed it is a new beginning. But God, if you're going to look back in retrospect, you see that God has intentionally channeled your journey, ordered your steps, permitted the haps and mishaps, as you could call them from your own point of view, that you've gone through in life. All of those things have shaped you for this moment. I believe that one of the reasons why God has helped me to be successful amongst young people in ministry, especially um, in my outreach to young adults, is because of my own struggles. <laughs> it's because of the secret sins of my teenage years and young adult years um, that became, as it were, a mess that gave me a message um, for, for, for the body of Christ in that sense. Mm -hmm. There is no detail in your past up until now that is a waste. Every single aspect of it, your mistakes, your successes, your wise decisions, your foolish decisions, all of them are instruments in the hands of God. Mm. All of them are, it is the sum total of all of that that had made the version of Kunle that Kunle is today. And so don't take that for granted. Don't just be looking for something out there. Start from where you are and the journey that you've been on. There is something in and of that journey that is key to the kind of calling that God is going to be giving you. So those are the few um, tips that I thought to leave Kunle with. I don't know what would be Anu's concluding thoughts as she chips in, if you have anything Thanks. to chip in. Uh, my co concluding thoughts would be from... 
um, a podcast I listened to, Crossway okay. Podcast. The mm -hmm. most one of the recent episode talked about plurality of leadership mm -hmm. and how that the way to avoid burnout, burning out in ministry, mm -hmm. or the need to show that you're perfect is to make sure that you're not the only person t making all the decisions in your church. Mm -hmm. I, I'm, I'm as now I'm, I'm assuming Kunle is now a pastor. Okay. So when you do get to the when you get to start fulfilling ministry, the advice is to have a body of elders where everybody make decisions together and in that committee the pastor or the senior pastor so to say becomes equal with the rest of the members mm. so so there's no veto power so to say mm. unless it's something unless it's something that needs to be really emphasized biblically when when i listened to that episode um I learned that that's one of the tools some pastors are using now and they find it very beneficial mm. so they're able to balance family life and ministry well and they don't feel like exhausted at the end of each day because like Ola would say like a pastor's job is not just on Sundays it's like 24 hours into the next day just mm. a roller a roller cost, coaster so in order to make the roller coaster be enjoyable for yourself yeah. try considering um, a plurality of leadership and it might even start now before you become a pastor to always confer with someone before you make huge decisions mm. that will make it easier for you to process things or to process this idea of plurality of leadership i just thought to um chip that into absolutely you. that would be helpful definitely to someone listening even beyond calling perhaps someone that is already um pastoring mm. thank you very much mm. um and thanks again to Kunle for the question um, it is my hard desire that in a few years time we would <laughs> reconnect and you'll be sharing how um, the journey that you are now on or the mm. new seasons and the new faces of the adventure that God will be taking you on. And I'm just praying for everyone out, out there that is that has sensed the call to ministry, whatever that looked like, pastoral ministry or otherwise, um, male or female, um, that the Lord himself will, he will lead you in this journey into the unknown he mm. will be your guide he says that my he says that the, the word of god is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path mm. that his word will, will indeed grant you that illumination for the now and a direction for the future mm. and his voice will always be strong behind you saying this is the way mm. walk therein as he has promised in christ jesus unfailing name we've prayed Amen. Amen. God bless you. I'll see you in the next episode. And remember, you are not alone today. God bless you. Bye. Bye.